Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Palm Springs Drive Church of Christ, where we worship God and study His Word, love one another, and reach the lost. If you're visiting with us, we're so happy that you've come, thrilled that you're a part of our assembly this morning. Hope that you've been encouraged and uplifted and um, strengthened in your walk with God in some way, and hope that you'll open your Bibles this morning to Judges chapter 11 is where we're going to begin, and Judges 11 as we talk about not allowing cost to cancel commitment. I'm going to read a rather interesting and notoriously puzzling story in Judges 11, verse 29 through 40. Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah so that he passed through Gilead and Manasseh. And then he passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he went on to the sons of Ammon. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the sons of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. He struck them with a very great slaughter from Arar to the entrance of Mineth, 20 cities, and as far as Abel, Karamim. So the sons of Ammon were subdued before the sons of Israel. And when Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, behold, his daughter was coming out to meet him with tambourines and with dancing. And now she was his one and only child. Besides her, he had no son or daughter. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. So she said to him, My father, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me as you have said, since the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the sons of Ammon. She said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go to the mountains and weep because of my virginity, I and my companions. Then he said, Go. So he sent her away for two months, and she left with her companions and wept on the mountains because of her virginity. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father who did to her according to the vow which he had made, and she had no relations with a man. Thus it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in the year. <clears throat> Historic, historically, this has been one of the hardest passages to interpret, and over the centuries, people have taken one of two views. Either one, Jephthah killed his daughter here as a human sacrifice to God, which casts Jephthah in a very negative light and would make him a terrible example in Scripture. But the other view is that he dedicated his daughter here to a life of singleness and celibacy and total dedication to God, which casts him in a positive light and makes him a great example. And I'll tell you, it was hard to know what I was going to preach on this week because I knew whatever position I took on this passage would determine the sermon. If it was the case that he sacrificed his daughter as a human sacrifice, we'd be talking about something different this morning. We'd probably be talking about the tragedy of not knowing God's Word. But I don't hold that view. I believe, as we talked about in more detail in our Bible class this morning, that Jephthah dedicated his daughter to a life of singleness and celibacy and total dedication to God in some way. She would be devoted to him in service at the tabernacle. So based on that position, here's what I want us to learn this morning from Jephthah, and from his daughter. Don't let cost cancel commitment. Commitment to God is what brings deliverance. We've seen this in the sin cycle of judges, that they sin against God, they forsake Him, and then God raises up an oppressor. And then it's when they turn to Him and they commit themselves to Him again that He raises up a judge to deliver them, and they have peace until, of course, again, it starts all over again. But notice, though, before God ever delivers His people and judges, He always wants to see, are you committed to me? Are you actually devoted to serving me? Here's a good definition for commitment, and Herb picked a good song about being loyal, because commitment means staying loyal to what you said you were going to do long after the mood you set it in has left you. The book of Judges, over and over again, shows us that the Israelites really only committed to God when they were in the mood to commit to God. 
They only committed to God when they were in trouble and they needed him in an emergency situation. Look in Judges chapter 10. In Judges chapter 10, this is where God kind of puts a stop to the cycle. And he says, this time it's going to be different. I'm not going to deliver you. And in Judges 10, he tells them in verse 13, you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will no longer deliver you. Go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your distress. The sons of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And he could bear the misery of Israel no longer. So their affliction in the first place was caused by a lack of commitment. And then when they recommit themselves to God, it seems like God doesn't really take that commitment seriously. He says, look, I'm not, it's not going to work this time. And probably there's some doubt in God about their sincerity uh, through, and, and about the strength of their commitment. But then they say, Lord, do to us what you will. And notice what they did in verse 16. They committed to God. They actually put away the foreign gods and they said, we're going to serve Yahweh. We're going to commit ourselves to you. And it's only then when God delivered them. But I think in Judges 10, we see some some truths, brethren. It's easy to serve and cry out to God only in times of emergency. It's easy to commit to God only when we're in the mood, only when we're in trouble, only when we need to use God as a last resort. He's kind of our final lifeline. It's easy to treat God that way, but that's not how God wants us to treat Him. He wants us completely devoted to Him at all times. And it wasn't until they committed to Him that He delivered them. And what we see in Judges 11 with this vow by Jephthah is a sign of commitment. Jephthah is committed to God. So committed, he says, that when, when you deliver me, I'm going to give to you whatever it is that comes out of my house. Jephthah knew commitment was key. To God's deliverance. And we see other vows by people who are committed to God in this way in scriptures. Genesis 28, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone which I set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Hannah, in 1 Samuel 1, she says this in a vow, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and a razor shall never come on his head. She's talking about a Nazarite vow there, dedicating her child to God in service of the tabernacle. These vows were not foolish. They were not rash. They were ways of demonstrating their unwavering commitment to God. Now, I'll grant you, Jephthah may not have fully thought through the implications of his commitment. I don't think he was expecting his daughter to come out. He may have had in mind one of his servants that he would have given to service in the tabernacle to the Lord, or maybe an animal that he could offer up as a sacrifice, but not his daughter. But the vow in and of itself was not was not a foolish thing. It was a sign of faith and commitment to God. And we saw back in verse 32 that God was actually moved to action by, by his commitment and he delivered the enemies into his hands. Here's the application, brethren. If we want to be saved, we want to be delivered from this present evil age and brought to heaven by God, we must fully commit ourselves to him. Jesus talked about commitment all the time. Look with me in Matthew chapter 4, please. Matthew 4, the beginning of his ministry, we have an incredible example of commitment when he expects commitment from his first disciples. In Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 19 down through 22, Matthew 4, 19 through 22, he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. These men left their family business behind to go follow Jesus. Didn't know how that was going to work out. Didn't know how they were going to make do. Trusted and fully committed 
to Jesus, to follow him. Look over a couple chapters in Matthew 6, verse 24, in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus talks about commitment here. In verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Jesus challenges us here not to ride the fence, to not have one foot in the world and one foot out of the world. You know, I'm pretty sure the Israelites tried to serve God and Baal at the same time for a while. And quickly you saw how Baal became their master. We can't commit ourselves to God, brethren, and keep our favorite pet sins around on the side. We can't commit ourselves to God and try to blend in and fit in with the world and be like everyone else. We can't commit ourselves to God and then only serve Him when it's convenient to serve Him or when we're in the mood to serve Him. Jesus says in Luke 9, verse 62, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Here's a dangerous experiment. Uh, Don't try this, but think about it. (laughs) Next time you mow the lawn, try mowing the lawn while looking behind you. Not going to go well. (laughs) Very dangerous. Because you're not going to run in straight lines. You're going to be all over the place with those blades. Because you can't have your body going in one direction while your head and your eyes are looking in another direction. Jesus says, keep your eyes fixed in front of you. Keep your eyes focused on your commitment to me. Don't look back. Don't look to the side. Look forward toward heaven because commitment to the Lord brings deliverance. The question for all of us is to ask, are we committed? Or are we looking back longingly at our old life of sin? Are we looking off to the side in envy at those around us who don't follow Christ? Are we looking off to the side because we're distracted by all the shiny, attractive things of this life that so easily pull our attention away from God? Are we only Christians because our parents or grandparents want us to be Christians? Or because, hey, look, that's just the way we were always raised. Would we be willing, like Jephthah, to tell God, if you'll deliver me and save me, I'll give you anything in return. Commitment brings deliverance. But commitment, secondly, comes with a cost. Commitment comes with a cost. Jephthah realized the cost of his commitment to God the moment his daughter stepped out those doors. It was his only child. And dedicating her to a life of celibacy and service to God meant she wouldn't be able to bear him any children. And that was the end of his lineage. That was the end of Jephthah's legacy. For those of you who are grandparents, just think of the pain of knowing there would be no possibility for you to ever have grandchildren. Now think of the cost from his daughter's perspective. Bearing children was so crucial in the ancient world to a woman's sense of worth and dignity. When a woman discovered that she was barren, it was like death to her. I think about Rachel, who, remember, was being ridiculed by Leah because she couldn't bear children. And remember, she comes to Jacob at one point. She says, give me children or else I die. Think about Hannah, who was ridiculed by Panina for not being able to have children. And it says that she wept and would not eat. This is why Jephthah's daughter goes away for two months in grief over this tremendous loss. Imagine, ladies, being told you can never get married, you can never have children. That was the cost of Jephthah's commitment for her. And it's always been the case that commitment to God comes with a cost. Abel was murdered by his brother Cain for his commitment to God. Noah had to watch the world drown in a flood, including his extended family. Abraham had to leave everything behind to travel to an unknown land, had to be willing to take his son up on a mountain and kill him, though God stayed his hand. He didn't make him go through with it. That was still a costly thing to go through. Joseph, betrayed by his own brothers, sold into slavery. Moses left the riches of the Egyptian palace to go suffer alongside of his brethren. 
David suffered mightily at the hands of Saul. Daniel's friends thrown into a furnace that was so hot that you couldn't even come close to the furnace without dying. Daniel thrown into a den of lions. Jeremiah thrown in a well full of mud and humiliated and mocked. And then think of the New Testament, the suffering of Jesus, the apostles, the early Christians. Commitment to God in this world of sin is very costly. It always has been and always will be. And Jesus warned us about that too. He said in John 15, verses 18 and 19, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Turn over with me to Matthew 10. Matthew 10. Some of the most challenging passages in Scripture, verses in Scripture. Matthew 10. Listen to what Jesus says about what our commitment will cost in our families. Matthew 10. Verses 34 through 39, very shocking verses. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. What is your commitment to God cost you? What does your commitment to God cost you? Maybe it cost you a close relationship with your friends because they didn't really want to be around you because you wouldn't go and do the same things that, they, that you used to with them. Or maybe they mock you. It may cost you your relationship with your family members. I know someone I'm very close to whose mother claims to be a Christian, and yet she's getting married for the fourth time. And she invited him to the wedding, and the whole family is coming to this wedding, and it's just going to be this great, joyous occasion for them. And yet he had to tell his mother, based on the clear teachings of Matthew 19, I cannot go and celebrate this marriage. That pained him to do that. He loves his mother. He doesn't want to he doesn't want any sort of division or tension. And yet, he knows his commitment to Jesus is more important even than his relationship with his own mother. And there is tension now in that relationship. Commitment to God may cost us a relationship to someone we're thinking about getting married to. <laughs> and we have no right to be married to them scripturally. Maybe to God costs us money that we could be spending on other things for ourselves, but we're devoting it to God's work instead, to the mission of the church, as Randy pointed out. Costs us time, could be spending doing other things, but we're here on Sunday morning. We're getting up in the mornings, maybe we're staying up late, we're reading God's word, we're using time to pray to God to read His Word, to serve Him in so many other ways. It may cost us some of our dreams and our worldly aspirations that as a kid we look so forward to, but then we realize that's, that's not the life of a Christian. I, I, can't really, I can't really do that anymore. It may cost us our pride and our selfish ambition. It will cost us a life that's all about us. What has your commitment to Christ cost you? And now think for a moment about what Jesus says in verse 38 about taking up the cross. Sometimes we say things like, well, you know, we all have our cross, our own cross to bear. And we speak of that sort of generally in terms of the suffering that we have to endure. And I think that's an okay secondary application. But everybody in that first century culture understood that taking up a cross meant going to your death. Jesus is saying, if you want to be my disciple, you have to be committed to the point where you're willing to die in the service of the Lord. That goes way beyond mood, doesn't it? 
That's loyalty. That's commitment. Now, I don't want to make light of what it has cost any of us to be a Christian, because some of us has, have endured great pain. But this verse sure puts our suffering for the Lord in perspective, doesn't it? Because whatever the cost of our commitment to the Lord, we haven't been killed for it yet. And yet Jesus says you need to be willing even to be killed for my name's sake. Take up the cross like I took up the cross, Jesus says. There's a book you can read for free online called Fox's Book of Martyrs. It records the history of all those who have died for their commitment to the Lord throughout the centuries. And I'll tell you, there are things in that book that are just very disturbing, too disturbing even to, to mention <clears throat> from the pulpit. Because these Christians not only died for God, but they were brutally tortured. Yet as disturbing as that book is, it's also incredibly humbling because it makes me realize in comparison, my commitment hasn't cost me much at all. There's a modern day publication a magazine you can subscribe to called Voice of the Martyrs, and it shows that there are Christians even today in other parts of this world. It's so hard for us to relate to because in our country we have religious freedom. It, it, we have it so well here. But in other parts of the country, there are Christians who are being persecuted, driven from their homes, beaten, tortured, murdered in other countries for their commitment to Christ. In fact, the founder of this magazine, Voice of the Martyrs, is a man named Richard Wormbrand, who was in prison for 14 years in Russia for his faith. He spent three years in solitary confinement in a tiny cell with no lights and no windows. It was complete darkness for 24 hours a day. And there was no sound either. The guards wore felt on the bottom of their shoes so as not to make any noise. Can you imagine? Three years, no light and no sound. He was also beaten, burned, locked in large ice boxes. He never gave up his faith. He wrote about this in a book called Tortured for Christ, and it's actually being made into a movie. It's going to be released next month. And I don't think I could watch it, I'll just tell you. And I'm not necessarily recommending that you watch it. But I bring it up because the cost of his commitment to God is astounding. And I really appreciated that song. I don't think I've heard that, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? But the second verse, listen to the second verse of that song. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? The cost of Jephthah's commitment to God and his daughter's commitment to God is astounding. And so finally, don't let cost cancel your commitment. When Jephthah discovered the cost, he didn't look for loopholes. He didn't say, well, you know, God, I, when I made the vow, I wasn't thinking about my daughter. I was, I was thinking of an animal or maybe, maybe a servant or somebody. You know what I meant, God. I didn't actually mean. He didn't do any of that. He just said in Judges 11, 35, I have given my word to the Lord and I cannot take it back. And notice Jephthah's daughter didn't look for loopholes either. She didn't run away from home and try to go live somewhere else. She didn't beg him daily in tears, groveling at his feet. Please, please don't go through with it. Please don't, please don't make me go up to the tabernacle and, and be alone. Doesn't do any of that. She actually said in the very next verse, it's only right, Jephthah, that you fulfill your vow because God gave you deliverance. She says we owe this to God. <laughs> we owe this commitment to him because he saved us from the Ammonites. Neither Jephthah nor his daughter allowed the cost to cancel their commitment, even though it cost them everything. I'm reminded of a psalm in Psalm 15 about integrity. And he goes through and he lists character qualities of people who have integrity. And one of the things he says about a person with integrity in Psalm 15 verse 4 is, he swears to his own hurt and does not change. In other words, he keeps his word even when it costs them. And this is what Jesus requires. 
He requires us, if we want to be saved, to not allow costs to cancel our commitment. He says in Matthew 10, 22, you will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. When we commit ourselves to Jesus in the waters of baptism, we're swearing our allegiance to Him. And He says it's only those who endure despite the cost that will be saved in the end. And I'll tell you, the spiritual battlefields have been strewn with slain Christians over the centuries who quit on God before the end, who allowed the cost to cancel their commitment. May that never be us, brethren. The question is, how? <laughs> that sounds great, Brian. How are we going to do that? How can we endure and stay committed despite the cost? For the rest of this lesson, I want to give you five practical ways to do that. First of all, count the cost before committing. This is something, again, I'm not sure Jephthah did. I don't think he really fully counted the cost, and so he was caught off guard. He was surprised by the cost, and gratefully he did, he did the right thing, but it could have caused him to turn around and and say, I'm not going through with this. Look in Luke chapter 14 with me, please. Luke chapter 14. This is Jesus' message to us in Luke 14. He urges us to count the cost before giving our lives to Him, before becoming Christians. And He makes that very hard statement again in verse 27. Luke 14, verse 27, Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after Me cannot be My disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Some people get all caught up in the emotion and the joy, and it really is a joyous thing that Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins, and now we can have the hope of heaven, and, and they get caught up in the emotion, and they make a decision to follow Christ solely based on their mood. And, of course, isn't it the case in many, in many worship assemblies today, the assembly is designed to provoke your mood. You got the laser lights going. You got the soft piano playing in the background, tugging on your heartstring. It's to get, it's to kind of evoke that emotional reaction. And then people come to the front and in droves because why oh, I just feel the Holy Spirit. I'm just I'm I'm overcome with this great feeling. And then when the mood passes, and then when it gets hard, and then when they find out it costs them, they're gone. The reason Jesus spoke so often and so bluntly about the cost of our commitment was not to scare us off but because he wants to make sure we're not caught off guard when we suffer. And we're not surprised. I mean, well, nobody told me this. I, that must have been in the fine print somewhere. This message is not in the fine print. It's everywhere in the New Testament and everywhere in the Old Testament that it costs us to serve the Lord. And Jesus says, make sure you know what you're getting into before you make this commitment. Secondly, remember what it costs Jesus to commit to us. Hmm, we've talked about Jephthah. We've talked about martyrs throughout history. But no one paid a greater cost than Jesus. Because he left heaven. He left heaven to come here. We're trying to leave here and go to heaven. He left there to come here. And not just to come here and live the dream, like Tim talked about. He came to live a life of suffering and loneliness and hardship and rejection and hatred against him. And to suffer a torturous, painful humiliating death, all because he was committed to you and to me. I think about Jesus on his knees, sweating drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, crying out to God to please remove this cost from me. He says cup, but he means the cup of suffering. He's saying remove this cost. Don't, don't make me have to pay this, this price, God. And then he said, not my will, but yours be done, because he was committed to our deliverance. So when our commitment to God costs us, remember what it costs our Heavenly Father and His Son to provide deliverance for us. Jesus never asks us to do anything that He has not first already done for us. Peter reminds us, you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood 
as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Thirdly, know that you are not alone. Jephthah's daughter had companions to go and to grieve with her. She didn't have to grieve alone. Look in Mark chapter 10. Very interesting interplay there between Peter and Jesus. In Mark 10, Peter comes to Jesus because he knows it costs him. And he wants to know what Jesus is going to do about it. And he says in Mark 10 verse 28, Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything behind and have followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will not receive a hundred times as much. Now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. When you look at the directory here at Palm Springs Drive, you see this passage fulfilled. When you look at your directory, this passage is fulfilled because you see companions. You see your brothers and your sisters and your mothers and your fathers who are also along this spiritual journey with you and who have also paid great cost for their faith in Jesus Christ. You don't have to suffer the cost alone. We're here together to bear that burden with each other and with the Lord. Fourthly, and I clicked that a little too early, the cost of not committing is far worse. Maybe someone says, well, look, if the cost of committing to Christ is like this, then forget it. I'll pass. Thank you very much. I'll just live for myself. But what Jesus promises over and over again is that commitment to Him, though costly, brings peace and joy and love and fulfillment and, and hope and purpose and eternal bliss. But to not commit to Him is to commit ourselves to Satan and to sin. And that cost is far worse. You see, the cost of commitment to Christ is only a temporary cost. The, com the cost of committing to Satan is an eternal cost. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 26, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? To not, commit to, to, to not commit to Jesus is to commit yourself to an eternity of cost in hell. What a terrible trade. <laughs> what a terrible trade. And the truth is, it's not just an eternal cost when you commit to Satan. It's a cost in the here and now. You just look at how miserable people are in this world without Jesus. You look at where addiction gets you, gets you nowhere. You look at where, you look at how doing things yourself and making yourself your God and making your own decisions. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 10, 23, it is not in man to direct his own steps. In our world, watching the news, talking to people around us is a testament to that very fact. When we try to guide and direct our own steps, it is absolutely disastrous, not only in this life, but in eternity, the cost of not committing is far worse. And finally, heaven is worth any cost. To Jephthah and his daughter, it was a very costly vow, but they both knew it was worth it for God's deliverance. And I understand it's scary to think about the cost of commitment, but it's only a temporary cost that will be eclipsed by an eternal reward. There are a few people who suffered for Christ more than Paul the Apostle. And yet he said in Romans 8 and verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Read with me one more passage, if you will, in 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. In 2 Corinthians 4, listen to what Paul says here about his suffering. Verse 16, beginning, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 
Think about this. We learn later in this letter that at this point in Paul's life, he had been beaten three times with rods. He had received 195 lashes with a whip across his back. His back was probably just one giant scar. People threw stones at him until he was nearly dead on one occasion. He was shipwrecked three times. He spent 24 hours floating in the ocean. He was thrown in prison multiple times chased from city to city by people who wanted him dead. He had gone for long periods of time without food, without water, out in the cold, without proper clothing to keep him warm. Yet as he considers all that, he says, oh, that, that's nothing. <laughs> that's just light, momentary affliction. And he says, when we get to heaven, we're not going to care anything about that. Heaven was worth any cost to Paul. Getting us to heaven was worth any cost to God. So if we have to suffer some momentary light affliction on the way there, it is well worth it, brethren. Don't let cost cancel your commitment. Would you take out your songbooks, please? Okay, new song, 266. Did I say that right? 266? Okay, 266. I see why Herb changed it. <laughs> That's a perfect song to sing. Have you counted the cost? The encouragement this morning is to commit to God and be delivered. Do you want to be saved? Do you want heaven? you got to commit. Commit to Him this morning. Give your life to Him. And if you think, oh, I don't know, Brian, that just sounds so costly. That sounds sort of scary. Remember, it costs far more to not commit to Him. Have you counted the cost Yes, of following him, have you also counted the cost of not? Commit to him this morning. Believe, be baptized, be raised to newness of life in the waters of baptism. And if you've already done that, you've wandered off and you've not been committed to him, what you do find in Judges is the mercy of God. That if you've forsaken him and now you're off on your own, if you come back to him in repentance, recommit yourself to him, he will deliver you. Be delivered be committed this morning. Come forward while we stand and sing.